Hi, this is Bill Knauer for Author Magazine, and this month I spoke with internationally best-selling author Patricia Cornwell. We talked a lot about uh, the uncertainty of the author's life, whether it was how she was uncertain, if she was wasting her time when her first three novels were rejected, the uncertainty of switching genres as she did recently, and also about how, as an artist, really just as a person, our passions choose us. We don't really choose us them. Enjoy. Well, Patricia, welcome. Good to have you on the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. All right. So uh, here you are. You're, uh, you, you may have lost count. How many books are we into this journey, this writing journey you've taken? Oh, my. You know, I actually kind of have lost count. I, it would take me a minute to, but, but for, let me just put it this way. I think totally, I've, totally I've written 40 or 41 books um, now, a few of those never got published because they were early in my career, but I've done on average about one book a year ever since I was in college, if you can imagine that. or grad College? I wrote my first novel in college. It was one of those that never got published and nor should it have been. Yeah. Um, they were, you know, poor attempts, but, but I did. It's, it's just something that I've always done trying to tell stories. Wow. All right. So let's go back uh, to college and maybe a little before. Did, so you say it's something you've always done. I've talked to a lot of writers and um, the average age is about nine when they kind of wake up to that something that they're they're interested in writing. They're not sure if they want to do it for their life, but they're interested in it. Was that true for you? No, actually, I, from about the time I could hold a crayon, uh, wow. three or four years old, I was drawing pictures and then I started when I learned, you know, how to write, um, you know, in first grade or whatever, um, then I would start writing stories. And I actually used to make books. I would design covers and I would sew them together with shoelaces. Oh, you were one of those. And, and I was always doing that, but I did not want to be a writer. I had all kinds of lofty ambitions for myself and it did not include being a writer. No. Um, I just ended up going into it after college because it was really the only thing I did all that well. But I've always been writing. And, and that's the funny thing about it. I think that I don't think that we pick what we do. I think it picks us. Yeah. Let's talk about then you, you go and work for uh, it's in Virginia where you work for the medical examiner. Is that right? right. Yep. And so you're now you're given firsthand experience or at least you're around the people doing all this CSI stuff. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. All the forensic thing. And oh, you wow. were ahead of the curve. Right. You were kind of ahead of all this. Uh, absolutely. Be because yeah. It, not because I'm so smart, but just because because <laughs> it was this was 1984, and yeah. that's the first time I stepped foot in a morgue in the Richmond, Virginia, because I knew somebody who knew the, the did medical. Creep you out? What did you no, think of the morgue? No, no. It no? Didn't, I mean, there were no dead bodies out in the open. Oh, okay. Market, but no, I was intrigued, and most of all, I was intrigued by what I was hearing was coming down the pike something called DNA or using lasers mm -hmm. to look at trace evidence on bodies. And I thought, right. this is interesting. And long story short, I started doing research and it eventually led to me working there. And I, I was there for about six years, never intending um, for it to take that long for me to finally get published. And I say this to other people who want to write, you know, rejection is not necessarily a measure of your worth, because if that were true, I wouldn't be sitting here. Yeah. My first four crime novels were rejected. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. well, the, the one in college never, I never even sent it to a publisher. Then the first three crime novels were rejected. Then I wrote Postmortem and it started making the rounds for the better part of a year being rejected. And wow. so I said, you're, you know, four strikes and you're out. But, but then Scribner's came along this was 1989 and they very dubiously accepted this whole new genre of, of the forensic thriller. <laughs> Back in a day when people used to say, nobody cares about laboratories or morgues. Well, that turned out not to be true. How did you deal with the rejection? How, I mean, emotionally, like if, how did, what, if, someone, if someone's going through it now and they're like, oh, my second book, it's getting rejected, I'm starting my third. What would you tell them sort of how to, cause it's all emotional, of course. How did you deal with it emotionally? It's totally devastating. It's absolutely devastating. You know, yeah. you get the envelope and you rush to yes. open it and it's a, a, a pro forma, you know, yep. 
a rejection note that, and then you get the manuscript back and the paper clip is on page 10 right. when you're trying to get an agent and you realize nobody's even reading beyond 10 pages of what you're doing. And I, um, you know, I went through that for, let's see, my first book was a biography and that was published in 1984. Now, okay. 83, no, yeah, 83. And, but I didn't get published again till 19, till, till 1990 when Postmortem came out. That's how long I worked, right. even after having one book out in the nonfiction yeah. field. But, um, and it was, you know, every time I would get those notes and it would be a book, I would work on it for a whole year. And right. then eventually when every major publisher had rejected it, you put it in a drawer. Meanwhile, I'm already working on the next yeah. one. And I went through this uh, over and over again. And I really did think, Honestly, after about four years of that, but being in the morgue full time and being a computer programmer there now, and that's what I was doing for a living, I thought, you have ruined your life. <laughs> you were a, a award winning journalist, and, and now <laughs> nobody would even hire you. You've been in a morgue longer than you were a journalist. What the hell are you going to do right. with that? Oh, God. Everybody faces this at some point in their journey, I think. Like, you reach a kind of just like, what's going on? Have I done this all wrong? Even though you're following your instinct, right? I feel that way all over again now that I've you started. You do? Absolutely. Now that I've started a new series. Yes, I mean, you're I've been in space now. Scarpetta horse. I've been riding the Scarpetta horse since 1990. So then yeah. to change and do something majorly big like the space series um, and commit the last three to four years of time to what uh, the, the two books that are out, World we'll, we'll Spin will be out very soon, as you're, right. gonna, as you're seeing. Um, and, and look, there's lumps and bumps that go with that. Uh, it, some people don't like that you're doing something new. Some people uh, want what you've always done. Yep. Uh, the, everybody, it, and it's hard. Some people don't know you've even done it because they're, they still think of you as doing something else. But you know what? You've got to be true to what you love. And if something if something strikes your interest or catches your attention and you believe there's a worthwhile message there in a story, and most of all, you feel like you've got to tell it, then you just have to do it. There's always never be an end of stories and we always must tell them. And you're still interested in telling, I mean, they, they still hold your, they still, you still wake up each day. I mean, sure. Some days, maybe not so much, just that's the nature of being a human, but each day you get, you go to your desk and that's interesting to you. That's still got your attention. For me, it is, it is my, my reason for being. And, and I've always joked with people. I said, a lot of people are stories. Mm -hmm. And then there's some of us who are meant to tell stories. I'd rather be the story. I'd like to be the professional tennis player. I'd like to be the astronaut, I... but I'm, I'm here to tell that's what it simply seems to be my mission. And I'm trying to do the best at it that well, I can. And when I do it well, it makes me happy. Does it? Does it? Yeah. Until I get the bad book review, then I'm not happy anymore. Well, <laughs> screw that. I mean, isn't there something, I got to say, there's a, when you step back from your desk and, and it's gone well and you've been in that zone, I assume you get into that zone where it's going well and you feel like yeah. you've discovered something and you feel like the characters in your case are probably doing things that you didn't entirely expect. Maybe they said That's things exactly you didn't. Right. Right. And you step away from the desk before you start thinking about whether it's going to be published, and how much it's going to sell. Well, you know it's going to be published, but how much it's going to sell, and what the isn't there a moment of satisfaction that that can't touch until you start thinking about it? Oh, listen, when I used to this, this hadn't happened in a little while, but it's particularly in the earlier years when I would finish right that last sentence. Yeah, it was the most emotional thing. You yeah. know, you'd, I feel a chill. I would sometimes just feel like almost like crying. You know, it's a bit. It's it is a joyful limbic moment when you finish a work that you feel is, is good. Um, and, yeah. and then there comes to everybody that judges and does whatever they're going to do, good and bad. And to be honest with you, I learned a long time ago, try not to listen to too much of that. Yes. Good or bad. Yes. Yes. It's, you need to be faithful to what your destiny is. And if you're meant to be the one who tells the stories, then do it and do it with all your might. And remember, it's not about you. And that's a hard nope. thing. No, nope, it's if not. You become successful. Um, I've learned a dose of humility after going, you know, around having the very big days where thousands of people would come to book signings to where we are now when that would not happen anymore. Nope. And you learn that most of all, this not really about you. No. Can't be. 
No. You know, it's interesting. I write, I had written fiction. I now write essentially memoir, personal essay kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And even that's not about you. You think because you're the, but even that is not about you. It's about the reader, even in that case. They think they're reading about you, but they're even then they're reading about themselves through your life. And that was a lesson I had to learn. Well, yeah. listen, that's the key to success when you understand this one little bit of mathematics, which is if you give people something that they want, they will come back. And I, yeah. and I, whether you're giving a talk or you're writing a book, give people something so they don't waste their time. Yeah. And then, yes. then it will come back. It's about them. But of course, it's also about what we want to do and how we want to say it. But you, you should never forget that there is, there's your audience and, um, you know, and I always say I am so grateful for every single one of those people because without that, I wouldn't have a voice. That's right. That's right. And and I, I, I found success when I saw writing as something I could give to others as opposed to what could the publishing world give to me. Nothing happened when I was looking for something from it. As soon as I said, I'm going, what can I give? That's when everything opened up. And that was a generous view as opposed to a sort of a greedy view of it. And it changed. Listen, I, I would be very, I would be very suspicious of anybody that wants to write a book just because they want a bestseller or they want to make money. Right. I'm, I'm sorry that, you know, I'd like to believe that when Michelangelo released David from the marble, he wasn't thinking about how many coins he was going to get. <laughs> right. I'm hoping he was thinking about the miracle of it Yeah. and that you do it for a passion and, and, and it's an honor, but yeah. it, it's not without its punishments. And sometimes it's also great with its rewards. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, listen, I got one more question for you, Patricia. It's been a joy talking to you today, but I got one more question. And what I'd like you to do is finish this sentence. Uh, we've talked about it a lot in one way or another, but let's get right to it. If writing has taught you anything, all the writing you've done in your long life, if writing has taught you anything, it's taught you what? To tell the truth. Tell that that's enough. Um. Yes, because if you're open to telling the truth, then the story will find its way. But you have to be open to it as opposed to saying what you want to say or what you think people want to hear. You've got to somehow, whether it's talking about who Jack the Ripper was or Scarpetta doing an autopsy, and even if it's fiction, as in the Scarpetta series, that you have to somehow know it, it rings true the message does, that somehow you have to feel there's a truth in it. I don't know how to explain it, but it's something that I feel, um, as opposed to fabricating something that that might really be pretty and the words are nice, but it's not it's not alive and it's not saying anything. It's because it has no truth to tell. So be open to being truthful. <laughs>